What's up, everybody? My name's Chris Enriquez. Welcome to another episode of Age of Quarantine. This is a show that I started when the pandemic uh, kind of, you know, started, I guess. Uh, yeah, shitty times, but we, um, you know, try to get inventive and creative and, uh, in ways to, to stay positive and, um, and entertain people. So, yeah, this is a show that I started a while back. St. Vitus graciously allowed me to uh, host a show on their channel, so thanks to them. And um, again, my name is Chris Enriquez. You can follow me at Chris Enriquez Drums. I play in the band Spotlights, uh, which you could follow at Spotlights Music. And my day job is at Revolver Magazine, which you could follow at Revolver Mag. Um, I am uh, also putting all the past episodes on my personal YouTube channel, so if you look up Christopher Enriquez on YouTube, you can watch all the episodes that you missed. That being said, I'm going to shut the fuck up about me and start talking about my guest, who I see is already prepared and joined, so I'm going to have him join the screen in a second, but um, let me just give you a quick backstory. I want to give a shout out to Frank Godlow for Metal Injection for bringing Trevor from Black Dolly Murder to a barbecue at my house here in bed last July during simpler times. Great fucking guy, really nice dude, really down to earth, um, and uh, he sings in a legendary metal band. I think we can call him legendary at this point. They've been around for almost 20 years, and uh, they have a new record out, and they have a lot of stuff to, you know, they've just done a shit ton of touring, put out a lot of records over the past 20 years, and I want to get to know my neighbor and my new friend Trevor, so... Uh, I got a boatload of questions for him, and if you have any questions, use the question mark box on the bottom of the screen, and um, I will get to the questions halfway through. I'm going to shut the fuck up and get Trevor on the screen. Let's get him on the screen. There he is. Back in here while the internet works its magic, and we'll see this guy's beautiful mug appearing shortly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Howdy, neighbor. How you doing, buddy? Good. You might be uh, the person cl closest in proximity to me that I've interviewed on this show so far, which is pretty cool. Uh, I was tempted to ask you to come do it in my backyard, but I'm like, you know what? It's a little too risky right now. <laughs> um, yeah, we gotta we gotta have a good show of uh, separation. You know what I mean? For the for the masses. <laughs> Gotta set a good example, Trevor. How are you? Uh, how are you managing to get through this uh, strange time that we're in right now? Uh, dude, I'm really lucky. I think that um, you know we dropped an, a record during this, and like all that momentum is is going on right now. And I've been doing a ton of press, and you know I've been pretty busy for a guy that's stuck at home and that you know can't do anything. But uh, so that's kind of been keeping me occupied and keeping me positive, you know. I think if you're in a band, it's it's honestly like the luckiest thing for us to have an album come out because all the other bands like just end up stuck. You know what I mean? We, we we could have been at the end of our last touring cycle with no no content ready to go. But, you know, as far as how shit can play out, I guess, you know, this is working out. I, I really want to get into that later on uh, and ask some more questions about, uh, you know, how you've been, um, you know, promoting the new record and the decision to move forward with it. But you you bring up a really good point. You know, the pandemic for musicians can really suck in the terms of uh, touring or if you were in the studio, but um, you actually have more people to talk to if you're uh, stuck at home because you get to do more interviews like this and um, I'm sure uh, answer some fan questions and stuff. So that's cool, you know. Uh, dude, people have been coming out of the woodwork, man, and I've been appreciating the hell out of it. And, you know, it's one of the few safe things left that we can do. We're lucky we have the power of the Internet, you know. Yes. Jesus Christ. I can't imagine a time right now, especially as a musician. I know that people have it worse off, um, you know, uh, than, than we do. But being a musician without the uh, powers of Instagram and the things that we get to uh, use to interact and entertain people. Thank God for that. Um, I want to tell you, I want to get to know you um, and, 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 and um, basically like get down to your origin, where you're from. Tell your life. This is a time when telling your life story is OK. So, yeah. and, and I see that some people are using the question mark box. So uh, around the 830, depending on where you are, I don't know uh, what time it is in, uh, in, in everyone's home right now, but it's eight o'clock uh, about here where me and Trevor are. So the half hour mark, I'll take your questions. Just make sure, please put them in the question mark box because it's, it's hard for me to read your comments while we're uh, shooting the shit here. But um, Trevor, where are you originally from? 
I am from Waterford, Michigan. Um, it's like an hour from Detroit in the suburbs, um, like 20 minutes from Flint. It's a nice suburban town, pretty typical. Um, yeah, man, just a typical suburban uh, youth, pretty much. Kind of a controversial place, too, though, uh, Flint, I guess, after the Michael, you know, the rest of the world kind of came to know it through the eyes of Michael Moore. But uh, what was uh, what was growing up around Flint like? Not to get off on a totally off tangent, but kind of. A um, I mean, I wasn't I'm not like super duper close to it, but um, I mean, it was always some place that, um, you know, you would have your guard up to be at. You know, it's always been like notoriously kind of uh, shady, you know, and lots of crime and stuff. Uh, there, there used to be some shows out there too. Uh, uh, we played a show in our very early days out in Flint, and uh, th- there was a good venue called the Flint Local. They had a lot of good ska shows back in the day when that whole thing was like really prominent. You know, at the end of the nineties. Um, but yeah, man, uh, Flint. I think of repulsion. Like that's the thing that pops in my mind. That's like the pride of of Michigan. You know, like the OG grind band and them being from like a little bit away, you kind of like hear, hear like legendary stories about those guys. Those were the, uh, the subject of our worship pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember them. I think we're, I think we talked about being around the same age. I do remember uh, repulsion and you, you know, you get a, uh, you get some of the crazier uh, bands from the grimy areas. So, uh, you know, it makes sense that they would be from there. Um, before you started getting into like, you know, your identity as a musician and, what kind of music you were a fan of? Like, what were your just your earliest memories period of discovering music overall? Um, it was definitely trickle down from my parents. You know, they were both like way into music. And from my dad, it was more like guitar driven stuff like uh, Van Halen. Um, the earliest song I ever like sang along to, I guess, was a, a Foreigner Jukebox Hero. Okay. And uh, <laughs> I was the... Uh, playing this G.I. Joe airplane, like a guitar, like sideways, this big jet, and like, you know, singing along to Jukebox Hero. But it was like Van Halen, Def Leppard, um, you know, lots of like AOR stuff. And for my mom, it was more like Phil Collins, Stevie Wonder, uh, Lionel Richie, and um, lots of pop stuff. I still still like 80s pop a lot from, from my childhood. All classics. And, you know, I, I want to tie that into uh, when we start talking about the band's uh, influences and style, because one thing I've always appreciated about the band is the melody that uh, that you incorporate in. Uh, you know, there are a lot of bands that just um, they just fucking go for it. And there's really not a lot of melody and there's room for there's room for everything in metal. Right. But um, that's something that I think really sets you guys apart, which we'll get into. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, that's that's why I asked that question. It's it's interesting to go back to and try to kind of see how that later on may have inspired or influenced your later on um, music life. Um, when did you start discovering underground music? How did that happen? What were the bands? What were the venues? Paint a, paint a picture for us. Uh, well, like the first glimpse of like even any kind of negative music really, I think was from Nirvana when Nevermind broke. And uh, I think for everybody from our generation probably thought the same thing was like wow you know there's there's heavy music out there there's negative music out there and you know i liked the uh the hair metal era too definitely but uh yeah there's something about that spoke to me and then you know the black album broke out right after that and that was everywhere and that was like my first glimpse of metal but um megadeth's countdown to extinction when that came out that like rocked my world and that was the moment where i was like you know maybe i'm supposed to like hang out with these black t-shirt wearing weirdos at my <laughs> school. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> definitely. You, uh, and that was huge. Are you, what do you, I, I, I hope you don't mind me. Are you like 37, 38? 39. I just turned 39 the I, other day. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I asked in a second. Didn't mean to interrupt. Continue. Uh, so yeah, you know, Megadeth was really that door opener where I was like, yo, I, I think I'm a metalhead. And uh, I also like kind of came to terms with my, religious status around that time you know there was a lot of conflict in my life about going to hell for like masturbating or liking metal or <laughs> all this shit. and like when i kind of found the metal heads they just were like man fuck that you know like i jerk off who gives a shit you know like yeah and uh yeah it was a, a time of just like you know discovery realization and uh 
It took a second until death metal appealed to me, though. Like, it honestly, the very first couple of times I listened to it, I just, I was like, ah, this is just a bunch of crap. You know what I mean? Kind of like when your grandma hears it, you know, and just like can't find <laughs> any mus musical merit in it whatsoever. And um, it was like, um, man, I was reading in Hit Parader of all places, you know, like not the coolest magazine in the world for a metalhead, but it was all I could find, really. And there was a, a, a review of Suffocation and Pierce from Within album that was like coming out right then. It was 95. And I remember like the article basically opened up with like death metal is on its last legs now. It's almost over. But there are still some cool bands out there, like Suffocation, Death, uh, Fear Factory, and a few others, they said. And those were like the first handful of, of heavy records that I bought. But uh, yeah, Pearson Within was my first death metal record. And that's a crazy place to start. You know, it's very super duper heavy, super like twisted. And I remember thinking at the time, like, how am I ever going to remember any of this? You know, like, how will I how will I learn the song and like, you know, like get into the song? Like, it just seemed like a maze you know what i mean of information it was just so like right different a lot I was used to. Uh, it was fear factory man fear factory back then was a was a was a very uh big deal for um people in ver various types of um uh of, of aggressive music so I, I love that you mentioned that and um the reason why i asked your age which i think i knew already is because you literally just we're the same age you described exactly the same way that I discovered everything. And, and 1990 to 1992 is such a cool time for us to have been there because you had Nirvana, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, Headbangers Ball. I wish, I wish people, I'm sure people digest stuff in a cool way now, but I wish that uh, people um, could experience that, that, that had it because it was a magical time. So very cool backstory there. Um, I noticed some of you guys are asking questions in the comments and, and I don't want to, uh, discourage you from doing that but please uh try to look for the question mark box on the bottom i promise i will get to your questions if you use the question mark box it's just easier for us uh to to do it that way okay so um you mentioned the bands that you were listening to but what about um the the, the venues and the shows that you saw local bands what about that kind of stuff uh my first metal show was megadeth my dad and my uncle took me and uh, Fear Factory actually opened the bill, and uh, Korn was also on the show, too. I didn't know who Korn was at the time, but uh, I was blown away by them, too. And um, uh, then it was like, then I saw Cannibal Corpse as part of this big fat tour. It was like Clutch was headlining at their moment in the sun, you know, when they were like on the radio with a self-titled record and shit. Like Escape from the Prison Planet was everywhere and all that. And uh, it was like Anthrax, Fu Manchu, the new Misfits when they first started coming around. Um, but that was my first glimpse of seeing a death metal show was, you know, seeing Cannibal Corpse live. And uh, that was insane for me. Um, then after that, shortly after that, we kind of like got wind that there was a local scene um, a bit closer to Detroit. There was a venue called Pharaoh's Golden Cup. And uh, they would have like a lot of punk bands there and a lot of hardcore bands. And, like, through the venue, we kind of learned about Earth Mover, who were, like, became my heroes, basically, at the time. They were, like, the heaviest and best of the hardcore bands out of Detroit. And um, they would book shows there, and they just basically, like, had free reign of that venue. And they would have, like, cool shows coming through all the time. And I remember seeing, like, Good Riddance on an Earth Mover show. That was really cool. Um, Catharsis, uh, Ascension, a lot of, like cool metalcore shit that was going on at the time and um you know that's when i kind of got the itch to play in my own band but we were so terrible at our instruments me and my friends that we could only like really manage like a three chord punk band you know what i mean like very primitive and uh yeah like we wanted to do all the cool stuff like you know make your own flyers and make your own layouts for your albums. And, you know, we wanted to do all the cool DIY stuff, except for the actual work to like learn your instrument. You know what I mean? So, yeah, well, that was my, early, way, you know? yeah, so my, my early bands are very primitive and, you know, um, but we had so much, like we took them so seriously. You know what I mean? Like we got in fights about the stupid shit that we did. And like, you know, we dreamt about touring and we used to read the get in the van book and just be like, man, yeah. touring just 
sounds so cool. And like somehow that book made me want to do it, even though it's basically like Henry just complaining about it. You know what I mean? The whole time. But um, you got to look at like the environment that Black Flag was touring in, you know, like yeah. we have it way, way better than they did. But, you know, they were getting taking the brunt of like mohawked punk rock shitheads and, you know, throwing beer on them and pissing on them. And, you know, uh, but, um, you know, just like Black Flag especially was a huge like um, motivator for me to kind of like, you know, take exactly to like take DIY seriously and, you um, you know, a lot of those things that I learned through punk rock, I would apply to, like, getting BDM out there eventually. You yeah. know what I mean? But, but in high school, I was in this punk band, Transgressor, and then we changed the name to Half Empty. And uh, we kind of, like, mutated through a bunch of different styles. Uh, there was, like, a pop punk era. There was, like, a minor threat sounding kind of era. <laughs> then there, at the end, it was sort of like... Um, I don't know what to call it. I was like falling forward. It was sort of like emo core yeah, stuff like a little bit. Right now, like <laughs> right now, they uh, they turned into Elliot eventually. Yeah, yeah, dude. Uh, I got a lot of love for all those Midwest bands, and you know, our scene revolved around initial records yeah. in a lot of ways. And uh, you know, Crazy Fast was in Kentucky. I went to that in '99, the second Crazy Fast, and uh, that was an eye opener too. That you know, seeing how like just huge the hardcore scene was and you know that people would came from all over the world to go to that festival and uh michigan fest was another thing that i happened upon accidentally yeah 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 you um i went to a label from your scene called lg on records by any chance kind of oh yeah yeah yep. they were kind of doing that whole uh they were it was more emo but but they were yeah they had like a uh, jihad and like uh <laughs> sort of like the emo violence kind of scene under wraps there that was cool Elkian was cool. They were from Lansing, I think. That's right. But, um, you're, you're but yeah, there was my mind right now. <laughs> there was a, a, a lot of cool little labels, a lot of cool bands like that we looked up to growing up. Like as far as like emo stuff, there was Empire State Games were like the biggest band out of I, Michigan. I remember those guys. Yeah, they were great. They were sort of like a Texas is the reason sort of type band, and um, you know, it was like. Yeah, we were just young kids. We weren't ever, like, in the scene necessarily. We always were, like, the nerds that came to hardcore shows with bowl cuts and, like, <laughs> humongous shirts. And, you know, like, we bought shit from the distros and we liked the bands, but we weren't, like, really, you know, like, like uh, baptized into the scene in any way, I don't think. But, um, uh, yeah, we just played, uh, you know, we played punk shows with our band, blah, blah, blah. And... Um, then I made a I made a metalcore band like after high school where I played guitar, and it was like influenced by like um, Morning Again, the early Morning Again stuff with Damien singing and Chokehold and um, Disembodied. Chokehold, man. Chokehold. Yeah, yeah, and uh, well, you know, look, the two main influences were like were Morning Again's first first output and Chokehold. Neither of who are very musically inclined bands, if you really think about it. Right. You know right. what I mean? Like they well, didn't have a whole lot of they're playing break. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's that was where we started and you know, it was a fun band. I used to kind of like I wrote most of the music and I was kinda of controlling about the lyrics and like I told the singer what to sing and pattern the lyrics for him and stuff. So that was kinda of how I cut my what were you playing in the band? What's that? What were you playing? you weren't singing in the band? No, I was playing guitar. I used to like play guitar and sing in like in the punk bands I was talking about. And then this band I just played guitar, but I uh the singer didn't know how to like write lyrics, so I just kind of jumped in and did it for him. And it was my first taste of writing like metal kind of lyrical topics and shit like that, you know. And um uh I was playing a show with that band and uh, one of the people that was dancing was Brian Eschbach, who is the other original member of Black Dahlia Murder that's still in the band now. And we became friends at the, at the show. We started talking through AIM and stuff. Remember AIM back in the day? That was oh, fucking. <laughs> yeah. <of course. laughs> and uh, he's like, man, you know, I'm trying to put this band together. Uh, the influences are like Undying and um, A Prayer for Cleansing. Oh my and God, stuff are you like, fucking kidding me, dude? Yeah. I've heard that, that forever. Yeah. That's, that's like what early Black Dahlia Murder was. It was a total clone of uh, Prayer for Cleansing. And we had breakdowns and we had like acoustic passages and, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, 
he's like, yo, I'm looking for a singer. I'm like, I don't know if I have a voice for that really, but I know I can write the music at least to write the songs. So I was oh, like, I want to try it. Really quick, you, um, you, you had a, an eclectic taste in music that I think was one of the, one of the reasons we started talking was because Quicksand came on. I don't know if you remember this, and you, uh -huh. you were excited about that. And I think I was surprised because at that point, maybe it had come up that you were um, in Black Dolly Murder. And I just, you know, people have these stereotypes sometimes. And, and that's what's great about the age of quarantine is we're, we were talking to um, Chase from Gate Creeper, and he started out on pop punk and emo. And I don't think that many people would have assumed that. And um, the whole that's what's important about telling the backstories. And, you know, there's a... There's something really cool about that. And I want to know, like, what made you, even though you grew up around punk, hardcore, emo, whatever you want to call it, what made you really just want to hone in on the more aggressive shit? What was it about that? And it's kind of a loaded question. When you were um, kind of uh, critical of what your singer and your old band sang about, what was it um, lyrically that you were, you know, why was that important to you? What, what was it lyrically that you wanted him to uh, sing about, you know, it's all a lot of questions. Sorry, but right. hey, no worries. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I initially got into metal first and then kind of like punk and hardcore kind of simultaneously, pretty much. And it was from an older like a friend's older brother and another friend's older sister. And we used to like raid their albums, basically. So like all of a sudden I was going in like every direction. I like pop punk. I liked, all, you know, all different kinds of stuff. But um. Metal, I never saw myself playing in a metal band when I was young because it seemed so, it was so musical. And like I said, like my skills were so fucking primitive and it was just like a dream, you know what I mean? Like uh, that'd be really cool to be in a death metal band, but just, you know, I was realistic with my skills and it was not achievable, you know? So that was like something that was kind of in the back burner of my mind. And when Brian reached out to me looking for a vocalist for his band and like played me the MP3s, um, you know, it was, like I said, influenced by Undying and um, that kind of thing. And it had like a Swedish metal twist to it, definitely. You know, a, a lot of metalcore was going that way at the time. Right. And they had, they had blast beats and, uh, you know, a lot of like metal chops. And I was like, wow, these guys are fucking good. And that was the moment that I put my guitar down for good, pretty much, was like, these kids, they were way younger than me. And they were like shredding my face off compared to me. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll just try to like get in there and be the singer. Maybe I'll get lucky, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, uh, the first uh, few times I came out to try out, I didn't really have my voice perfected for a screen, you know, but I like, I had a good show of stage presence and I, I was talking about how, you know, I'd been on, t like I'd been on this like ill-fated tour with that metalcore band where we went out of state. We went and we played on the air at NYU. That was like probably the coolest part of the trip. What was, what was we the played, band called? Uh, Blinded by a Book of Fiction. Is that, it is was that the, something that people can find online or no? No, okay. really. It, it's pretty much off the grid, man. We never like got into any kind of popularity back then. And uh, it didn't really like survive over into the file trading okay. era. You well, know what I mean? Black Dahlia is 20, almost 20 years old. So we're talking... Okay. The 90s, you know, and uh, if yeah, you were, late uh, 90s. Yeah, if you weren't signed and had shit out, then obviously, yeah, like you said, it didn't make its way. Yeah. So, so you know, I had that taste of touring, and I really wanted to do it again. Still, kind of motivated by that Black Flag book, you know, and uh, so when I was going to try out for BDM, that was, I think, the point that excited them the most about me was like. I had toured before. I, I was driven. I wanted to get us on a label. I wanted to be in a real band and like go out on tour and like, you know, get reviewed and be taken seriously. And uh, I had dreams like beyond being cool in the local scene because that was not going to happen. We were like the nerds of, of the of the local scene, you know. So yeah. we, we thought, hey, we'll just get out of here if we can. And maybe we'll like earn our stripes here, you know, while we're away or who knows. And um so by the third time I came, uh, they had finished a song and it was pretty damn good. And I had written lyrics for it and um, memorized it and stuff. And I came into that practice and just like crossed my fingers. I was like, all right, here we go. I'm going to sing the song <laughs> with them. We did it a few times, you know, front to back. It went well. 
somewhere the mp3 of me singing with black dahlia murder on the day i joined the band still exists but um i it's remember like I, yeah yeah i remember when i was singing it i was like yes it's working it's coming out the way i wanted to you know <laughs> like like sweet and um they took me to a show the show was a uh, circle of dead children I remember. and uh, there was uh a, another show got combined with it, which was awesome. And that happened a lot back in the day in Michigan, I remember. And th that show was um, Poison the Well, like at their height of like uh, opposite of December, you know. They were. Uh, so that ended up. Were a very big deal back then. They were. Yeah. They were, dude. They changed, they changed the face of everything for a while there. You know, every band had like two singers after that, you know, remember? Yeah. <laughs> they, well, the whole like, the whole guy screaming and then the guy singing melodically i mean not that they invented it but they they certainly were like the ones that i think caused right. the whole domino effect but, but yeah. Uh -huh. yeah yeah so i was at that show i'm hanging out with the band and they're like bring me into the corner of the venue and they're like so um you want to join or what and i was like yeah all right cool so i mean that was the beginning and we had about three three years kicking around michigan just being a local band uh didn't have many fans not many people took us very seriously but we played a ton of fucking shows. We played with like Bane. We played with Throwdown. We played with Creationist Crucifixion. Um, mostly hardcore shows. Uh, there was wasn't a lot like more hardcore than I realized. Yeah, yeah, there wasn't like a a really tangible metal scene that we at least knew about. You know what I mean? And metalcore was going in such a metal direction that there were all these mixed bag shows back then in Michigan, and you know, so you had like the bands on willow tip kind of coming through and they were more metal, you yeah. know, like a uh, status euphoria and circle of dead children that I mentioned and upheaval and stuff. And like, that was kind of where I saw us fitting in was like that more, that end of like the metal core spectrum really. Bro, how, did, how did the band form before you joined though? How did that, uh, how did the whole band come together to begin with? Um, it was sort of like, a nucleus from another band that had existed, uh, like a couple members from a different band. And um, then Brian came into the fold on the second guitar and he would become kind of like the, the boss man of the band. And he, he, he still is, he's still like the last word guy, like the dad of the band, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I knew Brian through different shows and shit, but I didn't know those kids like, very much they weren't from the same town and i remember driving out to practice with bdm the first few times and i was like wow this is really far you know because like i had barely left my town you know what i mean like uh just my world like revolved around waterford pretty much in in my youth and uh then i remember like you know i was like wrestling with myself about that I was like, do i really want to drive like 45 minutes to go practice with these 45 guys minutes seems like a fucking like like uh, such a drag at the time <laughs> Yeah. It did. It it seemed like such a big deal, and it was like so, so. Uh, I don't know, like, uh, but the early days of the band, we were really excited out of the gate, and it was really, you know, a creative time, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, you know, we had aspirations of like doing something with it. You know what I mean? So yeah, um, I remember they they found you because of the band you were in before, is what you were saying. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because Brian had seen, he saw one of our shows, and God, we just God. ended we just ended up talking on AIM afterwards, and yeah. he was asking me if I knew anybody. He didn't, like, know that I was going to volunteer to do it necessarily, but um, that's just how it played out, pretty much. And uh, in the early days, we had a glimpse of, like, an offer from Undecided Records, and they put out, like, As the Sunsets back in the day. That was, like, their big thing. Yeah, and we thought... We thought, wow, dude, like, we're going to get legitimized by a label. You know, this is awesome. And then that kind of fizzled out. And then the, the next label that kind of came knocking was um, World War Three Records, which was like a short-lived um, – uh, they had good distribution. They were in every record store for a while, but uh, they didn't last very long, and that whole thing fizzled out anyway. But those two moments, we started to get confidence that, like, wow, you know, maybe we can, like, make this into a real thing and, like – get out on tour and shit. So, yeah. um, and then, you know, we started to kind of, uh, metamorphosize the band a bit and we had like a talk where like, I think we should like dial back the breakdowns and 
you know, we're getting better as players. Let's like try to like make it more death metal and more extreme and focus on that. And um, so there was like a conscious decision. The fifth song that we ever wrote was, was pretty much the same Black Dahlia that you hear now. Um, you know, blast beat oriented, Swedish riffs. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask. That was, yeah, like, well, like but by the way, you are fantastic because you are totally like answering my questions before I get to them, which is great. I love that because I want to, this is all the great stuff that I want to know. But just to dial it back, when, uh, oh, what were the bands as you're going through this part of your story? What were the death metal bands or just, and basically like the influences that you're, uh, that, you know, to reference some, uh, of the influences that, uh, that right. you're hearing. So uh, as we were moving away from like Prayer for Cleansing and, uh, and Undying, that sound, we were worshiping at the gates, Carcass, Dark Ain, Early In Flames, um, yeah. early, early Soil Work. And a lot of those bands at that time, um, you know, In Flames and Soil Work specifically, uh, took kind of a u like a right turn and were like going way more commercial and sort of new metal, and uh, that angered us. And we were like, Nah, man, we got we got to do the same thing as they that they used to do, but like with more piss and vinegar. Yeah. you know what I mean. So like all even the more that you, that you that you mentioned from from the minute that you start talking about your history, none of you you mentioned all bands that didn't suck, which is probably the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, no, I'm serious. Because you, you, some of these bands, they fucking bring up, you know, some even some of the good ones. You're like, ooh, you don't want to say anything. But you brought up very crucial bands, bands that people watching should should do some research on that they might not know. But all bands that don't suck. So I just wanted to say that real quick. I, and, uh, you I, know, I, <laughs> it, it is kind of interesting that we didn't, like, take much from local bands. You know what I mean? Because most bands are influenced by, like, a bigger local band. But... We were looking to mostly these European albums for influence, and uh, um, it was just what we liked. And you know, BDM kind of started as a cocktail of everything that we liked. So uh, we were all excited about what was happening in in death metal. And um, <clears throat> you know, I've always been a hound for like checking out new bands and shit. And that was like the dawn of cable internet and like really deep diving in in the metal scene and finding out like way more about it and every time we went to practice i would bring a blank cdr to like burn mp3 cds and like cram like 12 albums on it you know what i mean and like yeah. it was just a, a time of discovery and excitement and our band was like an immediate reflection of that kind of excitement and uh um the kind of segue to becoming a real band was like when we got signed to the small label love lost and uh, they would put out like a few a few decent bands around that time. Um, Into the Moat were cool, sort of a Dillinger Escape Plan esque band. Great band. And uh, Set Ablaze, who we would do our first tour with ever. They were a Philadelphia band. And uh, basically, we knew like, okay, if we can get a, any label to press us, we can at least get reviews, you know, and we can at least use those as like ammunition to put in our like. PR sheet and hopefully get signed to a bigger label. And uh, that's pretty much what we did, man. We, we, we packaged up that EP and with a bunch of review snippets and stuff like that. And we, we listed all the shows we'd played with like, you know, national bands and stuff. And um, we had, yeah. And we'd weaseled our way onto Hellfest in Syracuse uh, by basically uh, yeah. like, we were bombing a message board basically with a bunch of people and they had like an empty slot where somebody dropped off and they agreed to put us on. So that helped us get some momentum too and helped us get seen a little bit. And um, I remember um, thinking that our performance there was really bad and like hating myself and being infuriated after that. Like, God, we fucking blew it guys. Like, that, but that, um, was, that was the pinnacle at the time. I was in a band that played those, uh, festivals called on the might of princes and we were uh, kind of an emo-ish band on revelation and that was like if you could get on hellfest in 2001 or 2002 you're basically like playing madison square garden like that's like the pinnacle right there you know i remember oh it, 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 it felt like that it felt like the championship you know what i mean and we had barely done anything before that really so it was a big moment and uh i remember being out there and talking to some people 
Um, and we were talking to some guys from Uphill Battle that were on Relapse at the time. And they were like, hey, man, they're like talking about you guys around the office. And we were like, what? Like, Relapse <laughs> talking about us? And uh, that just gave us the confidence to like, all right, we're going to make these press kits and we're going to send them out to fucking every label under the sun. And that's what we did, man. Uh, we, we, we got uh, 28 rejection letters before we got picked up. That's a fucking and- shitload of rejections, man. Jeez. <laughs> I've gotten rejection letters, but that's a lot, you know? Oh, yeah, dude. Uh, uh, you know, we sent to 30 labels and we were thinking, you know, all the like metal labels, um, all the like kind of metal core labels at the time, too. The and just everything. It, Rust kill. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everything in between, man. And, uh, you know, we got um, even getting responses from them was kind of like a compliment because, you know, that was not expected. You know, so at least they're like, we'll keep you in mind, you know, send us your shit as you get as you progress, and we're like, okay, whatever, it's still a no. But uh, eventually, Willow, Willow Tip got a hold of us, and they're like, hey, uh, we'd love to put your music out. And, uh, you know, that was like just the hugest compliment to us. And we worshipped everything Willow Tip had done, and I still do. I still think they're one of the best labels in the underground. And, um, you know, we're kind of like thumbing through that contract for a while when Metal Blade called. And that we thought it was a single man, and everybody at Metal Blade, I fucking love everybody at that label. I'm gonna shout oh, out oh, to, uh, to Nikki Law, Vince Edwards, uh, um, Heidi Weaver, and um, you know, just the whole Stephanie, the whole label. Yeah, anyway, sorry. Oh, yeah, no worries, man. They're like my family by now, you know, but uh, that was the beginning of it. Uh, Mike Faley called, you know, the kind of second in command over there, and you know, I knew who Slagle was because he was very prominent in their advertising and, you know, he was a figure in the metal scene, but I didn't know who documentary, uh, like the behind the music. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And I I didn't know who Faley was at the time. And when he called, like, we were, we were suspicious about it. We're like, is this a prank or something? Because (laughs) it was, it was so much later after all the other labels had like written back by snail mail that they called on the phone. So it was like, at first we were kind of like, I don't know about this. Then on the second call, we're like, okay, this is legit. And, uh, yeah, me and Brian made a pact basically at that moment. We're like, all right, we're going to quit school. We're going to quit life. And we're going to go on tour for as long as we possibly can and as hard as we can. And that's exactly what we did. That's what um, met- about too, is that that's not like a – that's a big deal. I mean, we're talking about – I'm sure everyone watching, I don't need to say that, but Brian Slagle was one of the guys – well, he was the guy that discovered Metallica and uh, put him on Metal Maskers and Metal Blade Records. Is um, When you're a metalcore band in fucking 2001 playing with uh, Throwdown and Bane, Jesus Christ, you know. Um, and I want to answer a question to somebody that asked. I apologize. We will get to your questions, so you are allowed to ask questions. Um, I have one more question, and I, I, um, and, and I want to let um, uh, Trevor finish saying what he's saying, and when he's done with that, I'll ask him one more question and I'll get to all the fan questions, I promise. Um, but yes, as you were saying, you, you, you got to uh, Metal Blade, they signed you. Uh, I want you to finish telling that story and then tell us about making the first record and then we'll take fan questions. Sure. Uh, so they basically like, the way we pitched it on our, our uh, you know, our PR sheet was like, we are going to make this full length record and we are going to go on tour whether you choose to help us or not. You know what I mean? And like, <laughs> so they, they helped us. They helped us get a van, which was a huge obstacle at the time. We were like driving to shows in three fucking cars. And, uh, and you know, we, we started to um, wrap up the demos for what would be the first record. And we ended up going into Cloud City Studios, which was headed by Mike Hasty from Earth Mover and Walls of Jericho. Oh, and, yeah, uh, I remember playing yeah. Walls of Jericho all the time. Yeah, and you know, and we worshipped those bands, and uh, we were very intimidated to play in front of him in the studio. I remember it was really awkward and really, you know, we were really player? green. Was he the guitar player? Yeah, yeah. Yes, he was sick. I remember that guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah he was the sick, definitely like the core of both of those bands, and you know, it was really intimidating recording in front of him. And uh, Ryan Bart Williams, who would become our bass player eventually, was also there helping out in the studio. But, um, you know, like the album is um, 
we're very green and you can hear that on the record. You know, you can hear that we haven't toured. We're not a super tight band. Um, it's not, it's before the pro tools era really took hold, you know? So like it's, um, it's pretty loose. It's pretty wild. Um, you can hear our, our youth and our naivety in that record. You know what I mean? And a lot of the technical chops we were trying to, we were reaching really far for our own abilities to like play what we played on that record. So, you know, eventually we get on a tour and play a zillion shows and become the like tight black Dahlia murder that people know now. But back then it wasn't the case at all. You know, we were really like, it was really Olympic. It seemed like to play those songs, you know, even though they were like the simplest songs of our whole catalog, basically. Sure. But, um, and we got, we got, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, and then like, we got pretty lucky out of the gate to be, uh, our first tour was with set ablaze and that was okay. Our, you know, Unhallowed hadn't come out yet, but uh, that was a good taste of like, of playing some decent shows. Uh, we played a good show at the church in Philly, uh, the basement there. That was really fun. Oh, shit, um, yeah. What are you talking about? Uh, the Unitarian? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was and, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Then the, the second tour was uh, Red Chord invited us out, and we were like, Great. you know, kind of like in correspondence with them before that. And they extended their hand to us, and they were doing, like, really, really well at the time. And the tour was us, Deadwater Drowning, uh, Premonitions of War, and Red Cord. And, you know, some of those shows were, like, 300 people at, like, VFW halls and shit. And, you know, it was pretty exciting to, like, you know, just be playing in front of somebody all of a sudden. And then shortly yeah. after that, it would be, like, uh, Metal Blade would kind of arrange us onto a Cannibal Corpse tour. And that was like just mind blowing I mean, for us. And unbelievable. And you know what? You're you're achieving all your dreams. You're recording with the guy in the band that inspired you. You're on the best label, and um, you also stayed on the label for a long time. What I was gonna say is, I feel like um, if there's anything to to sort of take away from this, as a if you're a musician watching, I think you guys stayed very down to earth, humble, good people, and that is um, that is. Yeah, that, that is sometimes i mean the talent is is important obviously in the songwriting but but being a good person and staying down to earth and and all that that will go a long way and i think you guys are a shining example of that from what i can tell oh thanks you know i i pride myself in that you know we've always been like fan forward and always been tried to be approachable to the fans yeah. and um you know like i uh i we really embraced the dawning of the social media era and, uh, you know, I've always been that guy at the end of the Facebook and at the end of, like, whatever it is. So, pe you know, the fans know that. And they appreciate that, you know. But um, – and uh, when we came out, we wanted to be taken seriously, like, as this death metal band. And um, that just didn't quite happen, you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, people took one look at us with our short hair and me specifically with my nerd glasses and shit. And uh, it just began this giant genre fight that would follow us to today. And, uh, you know, we've been called metalcore, deathcore, death metal, and just pretty much everything in between. But it's honestly played out to us being able to survive as we have. And when I look out in the crowd at one of our shows, I see all walks of the underground, every single, you know, there's punks, there's hardcore kids, there's metal dudes and everybody in between, man. And so like being that misfit band that we didn't intend on being, I think, really gave this thing like a weird angle and appeal to people, you know? And I think they took one look at us and, and thought, fuck, if those bozos can play metal, so can I, you know? I think that we liberated a lot of people like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking of fans, I, uh, I, I can tell that the, uh, the fans are getting restless. So uh, let me uh, start taking some of those questions. And, um, and everybody, uh, we get kicked off at 9 o'clock. Um, so I got 15 minutes, so bear with us. It's uh, it's just an Instagram thing. Um, it just kicks you off. So let's let's see what we got here. We got a lot actually. Okay. Rootless Ventures. Do you think Alex Merzen helped change your tone from miasma to nocturnal? You kept that sound after. You kept that sound after. Sorry. Okay, that's the end of the question. All right. So go go for it, Trevor. Um, now I think, I mean, the guitar players have really been the guys in control of the tone and that's like one of their, 
their prides in the band, definitely. So I'd attribute it more to that, just like them being very controlling of the guitar sound. But I mean, that was a an eye-opening album, an eye-opening session for us. It was way more professional. And um, we learned a lot in the studio during Miasma, for sure. Okay, cool. So there, there you go, man. Thanks for your question. Here's another one uh, from Asset. Would, will you ever publish a book with your lyrics and unused writing? If, if you do, definitely include illustrations. Uh, that's funny. Uh, that's a good question. Um, we are doing like a zine together as a band coming up here. Um, and I plan on uh, putting all the album or the, the lyrics from the new album at, at the very least in there. And like with some drawings and kind of explanations and notes and stuff like that. thought that'd be kind of a cool insight for the fans. But um, doing a whole book of, of the lyrics would be really cool, actually. I think I could get behind that. I should uh, write that down. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's... Okay, so here we go. Travis Pennell, ever think about making a cover album of songs from the from the 80s and early 90s? Um, it's something that we talked about before, for sure. I think in the early days, we wanted to do a split with another local band called The Plague. And we were going to do, like, cover all these, like, big four songs and stuff like that. Uh, we did do a Megadeth cover with our latest album session, uh, the song Go to Hell, which is, like, a more of a deep cut for Megadeth. But it was the song that was in the Bill and Ted uh, uh, Bogus Journey movie. But, um, yeah, there's still a lot of songs I want to cover. Um, a couple of us in the band want to do a No Effects covers EP someday. <laughs> that would be really cool. That'd be sick. Okay, last question I'm going to take for now is uh, from Michael Hudson. What are some non-metal bands you listen to? Uh, you are the current go-to for death metal playlists. But uh, what is he saying here? Uh, that's a long question, so it didn't, uh... It it's didn't, cool, I can see it. Yeah, yep, okay. He's basically asking what I like outside of metal, musically, and it's almost everything, man. Um, as I've gotten older, my, my, my horizons keep broadening, and, uh, you know, I listen to metal probably half the time, and otherwise it's, like, old funk music and old R&B and old hip-hop and punk and hardcore and, um... I like a lot of 80s pop and 70s pop, and um, I'm still like an AOR, like total dad rock shit. I really love. I'm always trading dad rock bands with our guitar player, Brandon. And um, yeah, man, I just love music. I love different, all different kinds of music, and uh, there is a lot of stuff I like outside of metal, and uh, it's a lot of butt-shaking shit, man. A lot of funky <laughs> shit. Hell yeah, man. Um, yo, uh, you want to shout out your Twitch channel and where people can... Uh can watch and keep up with what, what you're doing on there? Uh, yeah, my Twitch is just uh, twitch.tv backslash Trevor Sternad, just my name with no space. Um, you can find out when I'm going on there through my stories on Instagram that, you know, obviously you found my Instagram here, but uh, also on Twitter, I have the same handle, Trevor TVDM. But uh, yeah, since quarantine uh, popped off, I've been twitching a bit. It's mostly just degenerates into like a drunken conversation about heavy metal with people, but it's been really fun, man. It's been a blast. So if you want to hang out and need a distraction, I'm here for you, kids. Fuck yeah, there you go. So uh, Trevor is always uh, accessible, and you can find him on Twitch as well. Um, we're we're at almost the ten minute mark, which sucks because there's so many other questions. So I'm gonna try to breeze through these, okay? Um, so, mm -hmm. um, what is the secret? to staying around for almost you know you have fucking um I, I i can't even count how many albums and eps you have a, a, a you know a shit ton and uh, of course the remember changes what's the secret to sticking around for almost 20 years uh, um, dude friendship is honestly at the heart of it like i know we've had a lot of members through the band so it might not look this way but we're friends first man and we don't have anybody in this band that like we don't want to be around. So it's about having like a group personality, a group kind of sense of humor. And I think laughter has carried us through a lot of this. You know, there's a lot of hardships in touring, a lot of like boredom and like stuff that's not very glamorous, you know, but um, we also thought, you know, long-term, like we, we looked at Cannibal Corpse as like our main influence for like 
longevity and their ability to like survive the coming and goings of trends in metal. And um, yeah, we've just been able to do that. We've been lucky and fortunate. And, um, you know, I think kind of like our oddball status has kind of helped with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, it's, it, again, like just the fact that you guys are so down to earth and everything, it seems like you have a good, you have good heads on your shoulders, you and Brian. And um, that's so important in keeping uh, operation going as long as it has. What about writing though? Uh, what is the typical writing process like? You, like I said, uh, you, you have so many full lengths and EPs, you, you always seem like um, you're churning them out, you know? What's the uh, typical process like? Um, well, it starts with a demo in Pro Tools uh, from either guitar player. And by the time I hear it, it'll be like an entire song with both guitars, bass, and like some programmed drums that sound pretty decent. Then the uh, drummer will rewrite the drums with this uh, e-kit that's plugged into his computer. He can get the MIDI from that. So he can like make really detailed fills and shit. And uh, then I write the, uh, the lyrics to it. I sit in my underwear at the computer for hours on end and listen to the music like incessantly. And uh, I try to just like feel out the mood of the song. And then I choose a topic. And I try to make every moment of that song like have lyrics match the mood of the song. So it's like a wild ride, hopefully, for the for the listener. Yeah, you're very it seems like you're very hands on, which I, I didn't know until we start talking. I think that's really cool. Um that you're not just like, you know, waiting for someone to write a song so you can sing on it. You're very hands on. Um okay, so you you've had a, a long career. What are some of your, you know, favorite what are some notable let's let's go with your top three holy shit moments. Let's let's narrow it down. Um, first one was with the second album was, um, being on Ozfest metal blade, like, you know, flip the bill to get us on Ozfest, And that was something I had never s imagined for us to be like on such a high profile, uh, festival kind of tour. I just imagined our band as being not accessible enough for that. So that was like a beginning of a whole different trajectory for this band than I had imagined. You know, I thought we'd be like, basement dwelling death metalers forever you know so there was that then there was the next record when that came out we headlined summer slaughter and that was at the top of like vader cryptopsy cataclysm aborted despised icon Whitechapel, and this like amazing bill of like all my favorite bands basically and we were on the top of the bill in a fucking bus and having the time of our lives and uh that was pretty much the most exciting time in the band's history, I would say. And you can see it if you look back at our DVD, Majesty. We're all, like, young and excited and definitely having a good time. And thirdly, I'd have to say, um, when we played at Vakken on the main stage, we were the first band of the second day. And uh, I remember thinking, like, is anybody going to show up to this? Or are they all going to be, like, hung over in their tents? You know, it's like 11 a.m., and uh, that was our first time playing in front of, like, tens of thousands of people. And um, I remember, like, I was fucking terrified going out on that stage. But we did really well. They responded really well. And, like, that was, like, you know, kind of an important turning point for us getting our foothold over in Europe. You know, that was really exciting. There's no better way. All right. So this is kind of a loaded question. I know it's going to be tough to sum up in, like, a couple of minutes. But because uh, the last question I have is what I ask all my guests, which is a it's like a quick fire challenge, which might uh, we might need some time for. But let's just uh, promote the new album. Um, tell us about the new album and, uh, you know, it, it, you know, creating it, writing it, recording it just in your best uh, sort of um, way just to let everyone know. I, I think everybody watching has it by now and, and they've been talking about how much it kicks ass. But just tell us a little bit about the new album. Um, it's called Verminous. It's our ninth album on Metal Blade Records. Uh, I feel like it's the culmination of many years of experience and also this new kind of creative era for the band. It feels like a really creative album and we pushed our creativity to a new high with this one and tried a lot of new things, but it, it's still very Black Dahlia Murder, I think. And, uh, yeah, it just feels like a real accomplishment. It feels like a very epic album and a very um, uh, emotionally kind of 
it listens to an emotion, emotional response from people, I think. And uh, for a death metal band to do that, you know, you got to really put some thought into it. And uh, that's what we did. Uh, put a lot of a lot of elbow grease into the small details with the songwriting of this album. And uh, it's a super, super proud moment for us. It feels like the beginning of something new. We got a good shout out here about a, a particular track, uh, Wereworms Feast. Um, everybody uh, is talking about what a great album it is, and um, and they're right. It, it's great, and 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 as you mentioned, really cool that you're using this time to uh, promote it and embracing it and getting creative. Um, Trevor, we all want to get out of the pandemic, but we don't know when. Let's just assume we're stuck longer than we want to. What are the top five quarantine albums that you're going to keep if you could only keep five, and why? Uh, has to be Megadeth, um, Rust in Peace. Um, I'll, I'm going to keep two Megadeth records, actually. Like, they're like my, my main love in metal, my first love. Uh, Countdown to Extinction is another one. Fuck yeah. Um, Bad Brains, uh, self-titled record, the one with the lightning bolts on it. Um, what else? Um, shit. Stevie Wonder, Inner Visions. Bad brains, everybody. <laughs> yeah, right there. Um, yes, 90125, uh, the 80s record. I uh, really love that. Uh, like a trickle down from my dad. And um, is that five? I think that's uh, two Megadeth, one Bad Brains, and then... One Yes, one Stevie Wonder. Oh, there we go. All right, we got a little bit <laughs> Um. <laughs> We got four minutes on the clock. Do you want to have any uh, shout outs, parting words, drop the socials? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, man. If you need to find me on socials, obviously, you know, I'm Trevor TBDM here, but that's also my handle on Twitter. I'm active on there as well. I've been on Twitch lately. Trevor Sternad, no space. Um, yeah, man, just uh, look for us to be busy. We have a lot of content coming still surrounding the new album, thankfully. And uh, I appreciate all you guys for showing up and getting us on the charts, especially in this weird time. It's definitely felt by us and appreciated. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, man, just uh, look forward to us hitting the ground running as soon as this whole thing is lifted. We'll be out on tour everywhere possible. Obviously, yes. And uh, everybody uh, support record labels. Uh, streaming is important, but you know, pick up the new album from Metal Blade Records, support the artists, support the labels. It's a, it's a tough time for everybody. And, um, you know, we're just, uh, we're all very thankful that you made time for us, uh, the fans, everyone at St. Vitus, me, and we're grateful that you put out new music that we could listen to during this um, unusual time. So thank you, Trevor, so much for, uh, for all of that. No, thanks. thanks for having me, dude. Thanks for the kind words and, you know, yeah. Keep this shit going. This is awesome what you guys are doing. I, I appreciate it. Awesome, brother. Well, I hope to see you on the other side soon. Please send my best to your lady and uh, stay safe and healthy, my friend. Right on. You too. Take All care. Right. Peace out, brother. All right. Take care. All right, everybody. If you were tuning in too late, go on YouTube within the next 48 hours, maybe less. Look up Christopher Enriquez. That's me. All of the episodes in full are on my personal YouTube channel. But uh, right after this, you can still watch it on the uh, St. Vitus IGTV. Um, tomorrow, we have Taken Back Sunday. Thursday, we have um, Black Anvil. Friday, we have I Hate God. Next week, we have Madball, Chelsea Wolf, Emma Ruth Rundle, and more. We, uh, we keep it diverse and interesting. Uh, the St. Vitus way. It's all it's all good music and it's all good people. So uh, we're really excited that we uh, get the opportunity to talk to some of our favorite artists and that you support us. And um, I hope you all stay safe and that we're doing a good job of entertaining you. You can follow me at Chris Enriquez Drums and my day job at Revolver Mag and uh, my band at Spotlights Music. Um, on Instagram. Thank you to St. Vitus for letting me do my show on, uh, on their platform. And thank you for tuning in and spending your time with me this evening. And thank you to Trevor and Black Dolly Murder and Metal Blade Records. All right. Take care, everybody. Peace.